Hello and welcome to this week's News Desk with Chris Stafford and Nancy Gillen. And this is Season 4, Episode 21. We're recording on Wednesday, June the 8th. And Nancy, we talked about this before we hit record here, that we we thought this would be a pretty quiet week in the world of women's sports with the French Open now over and Wimbledon not starting until the end of the month and not much going on, of course, in the football world. But we've managed to gather quite a few stories, haven't we? Yeah, like you said, it's uh, it's it is pretty quiet, kind of a go between of a very busy summer for women's sport. But yeah, we're kind of like in the calm before the storm at the moment. But yeah, so a uh, so a lot going on behind the scenes and around the world as well. So yeah, kind of more stories than ever. Yeah, and uh, well, of course we've just, as I said, had the French Open at Roland Garros, and no surprises there. <laughs> Good job you didn't uh, lose any money on that. You know, no one, there was no one else to back, was there, except Iga Swiatek to win that. Yeah, I think everyone expected it. Um, I think it was actually quite surprising. I think most people expected her to uh, win without dropping a set, and I think she did drop one drop set. One, didn't she? Um, the whole yeah. fortnight. Yeah. Yeah, but the fact that people thought she was going to kind of just go out, go through the whole tournament without dropping a, a set showed how dominant she is at the moment. And and yeah, it wasn't really in any doubt at all. Even in the final against Coco Goff, she uh, got a very dominant win. You know, one in two sets. Um, fairly simple routine uh, match for her so she is yeah her 35th consecutive win yeah. that's now surpassed the record of uh, uh, Serena Williams is uh most the most her longest winning streak and it's now equaled Venus Williams it's still way a way off I think it's uh, Narita Lover who has the absolute highest uh winning streak it's something like seven it's crazy like 70 games or something 70 matches or something like that but yeah it kind of among her contemporaries Swiatek is now really establishing herself as as one of the the very best um so yeah it's it's pretty impressive and i do think maybe now we're coming towards the end of that winning streak just because we're going on to grass court um that's maybe not where she's strongest but you know you never know she could still you do have to kind of ask like who can beat her at the moment well i think that's the point isn't it you know whether it's her chosen surface or not because she's on such great form you know, and she's got that kind of consistency. She's on a roll. She's got the confidence. She's got the fitness and the strength right now. I mean, that's, you know, a big part of it that she, you know, may just dismiss any naysayers that think the surface isn't for her um, because of all those other factors. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think, you know, the another big factor is the retirement of Ashley Barty is, I uh, you probably say is, the, the kind of the person that probably could have beaten her or could have like given her given a bit of opposition to the dominance and she yeah she's gone so it's it's uh yeah I'm interested to see I think how it plays out on clay court I don't think Spitek is actually going to feature at any of the little tournaments happening in England before I think she's going straight in for Wimbledon so that will kind of be the first opportunity we we get to see of her and to see whether she can continue the streak yeah I guess she's preserving herself carefully right with uh, yeah that kind of form you know there's going to be tournaments that she doesn't need to play like you know nottingham or birmingham or or, or eastbourne in, in the run-up so you won't get an idea of uh, how that grass feels under her feet before we get to sw19 sw18 sorry 18 or 19 it's been a long time since i've been there yeah, I don't know actually. I don't want to. Don't want to say one when it's the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's your quiz question for the week, Nancy. I'm sure you'll resolve it by the end of this end of the show here. Um, so yeah, good luck to her. We will be following the Wimbledon tournament, which starts June 27th through July 10th. Now, there's one young lady we're a little bit concerned about whether she'll be fit for Wimbledon, and that's uh, the British player, of course, who won the U.S. Open last fall, Emma Raducanu, who suffered another injury in, at uh, Nottingham this week. Nancy, there's talk about you know she not having the team behind her that she needs for this level of on at the first year on tour. Yeah, well, she's it's quite interesting what she's what's been happening with the coaches and that she seems to be kind of like testing things out. And I, I read one article a few weeks ago where it was kind of 
saying like her I think it's her and her father are kind of you know the the decision makers and they kind of use one coach and then they get all the information they possibly can from them and then get another coach and use get all the info like kind of like like you know gathering all this information from different people and they're just moving on quite quickly but yeah as we've seen with the coaches she hasn't had a a kind of someone that's been a constant um with her since she won the US Open um and yeah I mean it obviously her form has been very turbulent like we've seen glimpses tiny glimpses of, of what she did at the US Open last year but injury has really um definitely kind of hampered her season so far and yeah another one at, at um the Nottingham Open I think she has said that she is like she is probably going to play Wimbledon but she's dropped out of Birmingham um which is next week and then I think Eastbourne Eastbourne and uh, Wimbledon she's looking likely to be able to do that but again she's just not been able to get like that run of form that run of matches under her belt to kind of build up form and and go from there it's it's been very stunted um basically every tournament that she's played at um and yeah like you said whether you know she needs people around her to kind of advise like you know should should she you know i suppose how she's playing and stuff the ways to prevent injury and things like that that's but yeah potentially maybe she needs someone that's more of a constant in her coaching team yeah um you know obviously she's got to get that right it takes a bit of tweaking doesn't it especially with this being the first year on the tour and we have to remember she's still a teenager you know so there's a lot of you know tweaking and get to get it right for her and her broken but I you know it just seems extraordinary she's having such bad luck such a bad run of injuries um, and she doesn't want to be labeled uh, to be injury prone does she that's for sure especially this time in her career um, but you know the one thing that struck struck me there was a the article um, at, on CNN about her injury they immediately connected it with Alexander Zverev, of course, who had that injury at Roland Garros, and he's out um, for a while now with three torn uh, ligaments. Uh, it was a terrible accident. But it's as almost as if they couldn't run that story without men- mentioning a man and, the, and a player who's also injured, a male player. Did you notice that? Yeah, that's very true, actually. It's kind of a weird, it's a weird link, isn't it? Because Right, there were two sentences, two sentences about Emma, and then they went straight into Alexander's injury. Yeah, and it's, I mean, they're, you know, they play on different tours. They're, you know, completely different, in different competitions, essentially. And yeah, I don't, yeah, why not just do it as two separate articles? Yeah. That is strange. Yeah. Um, I have noticed there's a shocking new story come out um, about the British uh, player, another British player, Tara Moore. She's been provisionally suspended uh, from test- she, because she tested pos- positive, and she says she's never knowingly taken a banned substance. But did you re- read that? She played at the uh, French Open. Uh, she was in the doubles event, but according to the tennis anti-doping program, she took some prohibited substances, which have cost her the chance to play on the WTA tour for future tour tournaments indefinitely. That's the uh, young uh, 29-year-old British tennis star. Um, did you read that story? No, I haven't actually seen that. I need to, to look into that. But indefinitely, is that's uh, is she wasting like a hearing or something like that? Yeah, well, according to the reports, the, she provided a sample in April uh, while oh, okay. she was playing in Colombia. <laughs> And that was, you know, the split sample A and B and made the analysis. And then uh, the, the A sample contained some prohibited substances. And, you know, so it has to go through the anti, te, the tennis anti-doping program protocols. Um, but she's obviously denying it. She says she's never knowingly, knowingly taken any banned substance. So she's surprised as anybody that she tested positive so yeah provisionally suspended so uh, yeah we'll follow that story and keep you posted um i want to come back to another tennis story that came out of um the french open nancy and that's uh, about uh, uh, a chinese teenager who who lost her dreams when she a dream of playing again you know with to um Iga Swiatek because of um menstrual cramps she came out you know uh, openly to talk about that that she was hampered by that did you see that story 
I did, yeah. And and when I mentioned earlier about the set being dropped, so I said dropping a, a set, it was against, yeah, Seng uh, Chin Wen, the Chinese tennis player um so sh- yeah she had actually won the first set against Switek, um which is a a massive achievement really considering the mm. fact that um no one's really done that in if uh, no one's done that really since the start of the year um but yeah like you said she then uh started suffering from mental cramps um and had to uh, basically f- well she played the rest of the game but she lost uh six love six two so as you know, obviously couldn't put up much of a fight at all. Um, and yeah, then afterwards she she talks about it, which I think is is great. I think it's good that, you know, athletes to being open about it, that it is something that affects their um game. And I saw like a lot of conversation happening afterwards about it. And, you know, I think <laughs> there was a lot of people saying, you know, when we have the debate about tennis players getting time time out and toilet breaks and all of that, that for a lot of the female players there is actually like quite a legitimate reason why they might need to go to the toilet um so yeah just kind of sparked a whole conversation and and yeah she just kind of said that I think she said she I wish I can be a man on court yes <laughs> so obviously it doesn't didn't you know kind of wish that she could be playing I suppose without that hindrance and you know it, it is a once once a month so that is going to pop up during tournaments quite a lot and she you know won a set against the world number one and the eventual winner and it must be incredibly frustrating to to be at that stage and then just be hindered by, you know, yeah. something that you can't control at all. No. So, but yeah, fair play to her for for speaking openly about that because it's definitely an important conversation that needs to be had. And as per our previous topic, you know, there's a limit to what they can take in terms of yeah. pain control during a tournament. Yeah, that's another interesting kind of aspect to it. Like you said, I think... I think they can can take painkillers or something, but but yeah, that's very limited. And then I know there's like higher strength uh, painkillers that no like people non athletes can take. I don't think athletes can take them. So you're, yeah, you're incredibly limited to to how you know what how you can how you deal with that. It's and it's obviously very challenging and can be really debilitating for for athletes if they're trying to you know play elite elite sport. I think a lot of people have menstrual cramps and can't just like function do daily daily things so like playing elite sport at the highest level um it's got to be completely dehabilitating so yeah yeah. for sure for sure um now we've got another tennis story and that uh, is this took me by surprise simona halep you know has been on the tour for a long time very experienced player but during the french open she spoke openly about experiencing a panic attack uh you know that i i just surprised me that she would in the first place but why should it surprise me i mean it surprised me because she's so experienced and you have to wonder if she's experienced um, that before if that's hampered her in her in her game yeah it is i think she well she said in the quotes that um well so yeah when she was asked what happened she said a little panic attack let's say and then she said it's new and i didn't know how to handle it so it was tough to breathe i was not very clear on what i'm doing it was a difficult moment so it sounds like something that hasn't come up in her career at all and that was kind of obviously she didn't really know how to handle it properly in that or you know what to do in that situation um but yeah very very experienced um player it's again interesting that she's she said as well that she came close to retiring from tennis last year because of struggling with a calf injury and then the impact of the pandemic as well so you know, maybe that it's just been a very, very stressful past two years for her to come so close to retiring. Shows that, you know, it was obviously been really tough. So maybe that is kind of mentally taking its toll while she's on the court now. Um, so, yeah, hopefully she kind of, you know, she's such a great player. So hopefully she can, I suppose, if, you know, come up with, you know, if that does happen again, that she now, now it's happened, she can come up with coping mechanisms to deal with it if it happens in a match again. Yeah, find hopefully she has the team behind her to you know, you help her. Um and have you say do you develop some kind of coping mechanism, don't you, um with those kind of problems. Um but yeah, awful that shit it would happen 
on 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 at, at a grand slam you know during a competition at that level um right one more tennis story before we move on to something completely different and uh, this is good news for gb great britain is hosting the Billie jean king cup yeah it is uh it's very exciting news so yeah the previously known as uh, the Fed Cup, but I think it was rebranded last year or the year before. Um, yeah, 12 team tournament um, and Britain will be hosting. So it'd be in Glasgow in November. Um, and because of that as well, Britain now automatically qualifies. So they, they weren't going to play at the tournament um, because they lost the qualifying playoff. But now that they're hosts, they do go through. Um, so yeah, that should be really exciting. I think it's uh, always a bit of a, quite a fun tournament. Um, with kind of all, you know, all these players representing their countries. It's like the World Cup of Tennis, I suppose. And yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a pretty good time for uh, women's tennis in Britain, I suppose. It's been such a quiet, you know, there, there hasn't been too many names and Radicani's kind of come through and won the US Open. So having a player like her, but then, you know, there's people like uh, Harriet Dart, who I think it was Indian Wells. She had a really, she had a pretty decent run. Um, and yeah, there's a few other kind of really like, you know, talented British uh, female tennis players who maybe don't get as much of the limelight. So it'd be exciting to be exciting to see how, how they get on, but also just Britain hosting it in general. I think that'd be yeah a cool event to have happening. Yeah, because we don't have the Whiteman Cup anymore because the US dominated that so much that it really became a one sided competition. I don't. Yeah, I don't know, actually know what that is. Oh, there you go, you see. Let's do, I'll do a Google and find out. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we've got a few football stories and ice skating and then gymnastics, so don't go away. Well, Nancy, we covered the Larry Nassar story in gymnastics, the abuse cases that uh, ended up in court, ended up with him being uh, jailed pretty much for life. Um, But we know that there was some uh, inefficiency when it came to the FBI and their handling of this case. And now I see today in the New York Times that 90 of these women, the gymnasts, are planning to sue the FBI in its failure to investigate Larry Nassar. Yeah, so they're suing them for a billion dollars, which is obviously a lot. So that's 800 million pounds. Um, and like you say, they're um, because of the mishandling of the of the case. So uh, the claimants, which includes a lot of the kind of the US, US's greatest gymnastics talents, so Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, Michaela Maroney, all Olympic uh, gold medalists. Um, they say the FBI mishandled the credible complaints of sexual assault, um, which we like we know because there was that report uh, from the US Justice Department office of the Inspector General last year um, who said there was missteps and cover-ups by FBI agents um, which allowed NASA's abuse to continue for more than a year after the case was first opened in uh, 2015. So it sounds like the gymnasts or the claimants have quite solid ground on which to um, sue the FBI. Um, so yeah, I think that of, you know, that whole case kind of came to a bit of a close, um, last year, but, you know, I think it is important that they are doing this and it is kind of continuing to go on because these kind of actions, you know, holding people or organizations like the FBI, FBI to account, make sure that if there's a similar situation in the future, um, hopefully they'd be a bit more reactive to it and, and won't kind of, you know, do what happened with the Larry Nasser case, which allowed abuse to continue. Yeah, uh, hopefully. Uh, well, we'll follow that story and, and let you know how that unfolds. Um, I want to just turn to a, a story that you picked up uh, out of the BBC, from the BBC this morning, about ice skating's minimum age has been raised. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this is this is uh, all kind of has happened after Camilla Valieva, the uh, Russian ice skater at the Beijing um, Olympics in February, and it was February and March. Um, so just a quick recap of that story. Uh, yeah, she's a 15 year old at the time. Uh, she was banned, provisionally banned, while in Beijing for a failed drugs test. Um, then that was 
overturned. So she then um, competed and she was really like visibly, visibly like shaken and upset when she was competing. Um, and yeah, she won. I can't, she didn't medal at all. Um, she, because of the stumbles, she had been at first place and then she dropped. She, yeah, she was first place before this all came out. It all came out. She competed, was very visibly shaken and she dropped out of the medals and, and finished fourth. And I think just, you know, there's a whole a separate conversation about the doping side of it and, and all of that. But then there was, a you know, another conversation about the fact she was essentially 15 and she was clearly not being treated very well by the coaches at all. I, that was obvious at the in the arena at the time. Um, and just the fact that a t- kind of teenage girl was, was going through this on a very uh, public stage. So that kind of led to a conversation taking place about raising the minimum age uh, for athletes in um, senior ice skating events. So it had been 15 and the International Skating Union have now uh, raised that to 17 years old uh, to protect the physical, mental health and emotional well-being of uh, the skaters. So, yeah, kind of just the domino effect essentially from that Valieva case at the Beijing Olympics, um, which, you know, the whole thing was just kind of very... It you know it was a very kind of sad and um, not, it wasn't a positive story to come out of the games at all. And while that doping case is still yet to be resolved, uh, so that's still kind of going through, you know, all the relevant bodies and will eventually probably end up in CAS again. Um, yeah, the the ISU have now raised the minimum age to seventeen. Yeah, that was extremely traumatic for her, wasn't it? In in, in front of the the whole world, um, what she went through. Yeah, and I think you know, I think people thought that after that had all happened, that she shouldn't have just she should have just not competed. Essentially, yeah. like she clearly, clearly mm-hmm. on well, when she was on the ice, was not in a good uh, mental state to be competing. Um, and yeah, I think just the reaction from the coaches and stuff like that, it was clear that she wasn't in a supportive environment. People weren't looking out for her. Uh, it's probably how she ended up in that situation in the first place. So, yeah, I think it's it's definitely a good move by the ISU and, and will definitely protect kind of younger athletes. Yeah. For sure. Um, I think that's a good thing. But it's over time, isn't it? You know, for the, I think they're moving it up to 16 yeah. for the next season and then in 2004, 2005, then they're moving it up to 17 years old. So, yeah, a good move in, in my opinion. All right, some football stories. Uh, now, I don't know where to start, but what came out of this morning was the um, news from Orlando Pride that Amanda Kroll and Sam Green have been placed on administrative leave. This is not a good story for Orlando Pride. They've gone through all kinds of uh, controversial issues uh, in recent times, so th- they don't need this. But tell, tell us more about it, Nancy. Yeah, so like you said, it's not a good story for Orlando Pride, but just the NWSL is, in general, like we've had so much of this in um, yeah. in in the past year. Um, so yeah, Amanda Cromwell, the Orlando Pride head coach and first assistant coach Sam Green have been placed on temporary administrative leave um, pending the results of a current investigation. Um, so it doesn't say necessarily why they're being investigated, but it's by the NWSL and the NWSL Players Association Joint Investigative Team. Um, And yeah, it is quite vague. It's no final determinations or conclusions have been reached. Um, But I mean, like I said, we've we've had a lot of this in the NWSL in... It was last season, really. I think it was almost every team had some kind of investigation going on and a lot of coaches and stuff found of found guilty of misconduct. Um, that's not to say that is what's happened here, but that kind of investigation, I think, suggests it's something like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's kind of just waiting to see what the outcome of this is and... I suppose, yeah, just quite dispiriting that, that that these kind of issues are still happening. Yeah, it certainly is. All right, next story is about the WSL, the Women's um, Soccer League in the UK, and your increase in, in TV viewing, which is very impressive. This bodes well. Yeah, and it's this. Is, I mean, this is definitely more of a uh, positive story. But yeah, so the Women's Super League viewing hours have had a near fourfold increase from last season. Um, so 
In total, fans tuned in for 34.048 million viewing hours, up from 8.83 million for 20 from 2020 to 2021, so last season, which is absolutely massive. Um, it it's really like is a hundred and forty percent rise in viewership. Uh, yeah, uh, in the first part of 2022, and we haven't got to the Euros yet. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I mean, that's massively helped by the new TV deal. So games are now shown free to air on the BBC. Um, there's also games on Sky as well. So Sky here is like the main channel where people watch men's football. So normally if you're watching Sky, there's a women's match straight after. So people obviously just sticking around and, and watching that. So it just shows having these women's games on TV, people are willing to watch them. Um, that just shows by the absolute massive um, increase in in um in uh, viewership. And yeah, I think that the study found that there was a 113% increase in coverage hours. So, you know, if you increase the coverage, people will watch essentially. And like you said, it's a very good point about we haven't even got to the Euros yet, uh, which is again going to be on free to air TV. And there's nothing else, like there's no other football tournament happen- happening this summer. So people are very likely going to start watching it. So, yeah, it's a very exciting time, I think, for women's football over here. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's a bit too lively for the Canadian women's soccer team right now. There's um, echoes here of the US team. But the Canadian women's national soccer team uh, are voicing their concern over equal pay. Um, How new is this story, Nancy? Is, Is this just dropped? Well, this is so. This has kind of come from. I don't know if you saw, but on Sunday, uh, the Can- the Canadian men's team uh, they refused to play a friendly match against Panama. So they essentially went on strike uh, because of a contract dispute between the players and uh, Canada Soccer, the national governing governing body. Um, so yeah, the match was cancelled, and then the Canadian men's team released a statement saying um, that kind of listing all the things they wanted. So because they've qualified for the Men's World Cup, I think for the second time in Canada's history or something like that, they want to ensure they're getting adequate prize money. So they've yeah in their um, statement they've asked for forty percent of the prize money from the World Cup. Um, then they also asked for an equitable compensation structure for the men and women's teams. So they both get 40% of the prize money and the development of a women's domestic league. So I think at first glance, that sounds good. Like people, you know, they've thought about the women's team and they essentially want, they're asking for the same amount of money. But then the Canadian women's team um, said, basically responded and said that all, although they were kind of happy with the men mentioning them they weren't actually they didn't view as what they'd asked for as equal pay uh, because because of the differences in prize money for the men and the women's world cup so 40 percent prize money of the men's world cup is so much higher than 40 percent of prize money from the women's world cup like that that's not equal pay that's just relative to the amount of prize money that is on offer at men and women's tournaments so the women's team said they wouldn't accept an agreement that doesn't offer equal pay um, and I think almost sided with Canada Soccer. They said that Canada Soccer had had suggested um, something that was actually much more aligned to equal pay. So, yeah, everyone's a bit at odds there. And I think people initially saw the statement from Canada, so- the men's players, and thought, oh, this is great. Like they're mentioning the women's team. But then when you actually think about it, it's not really of benefit to the women's team and and they're kind of on a different wavelength as well. So yeah, a very interesting dispute, something to keep an eye on. Um, And again, quite similar to the US, I I imagine they're looking over the border at the US and thinking in the US, they're pooling the money like 50, 50, that's they're splitting it. Um, And I think Canada women also have the benefit of being more successful than the men's team. So like I said, the men have only qualified for the world cup for the second time. Um, while Canada are, you know, constant constant presence at the Women's World Cup and they are the current Olympic champions as well. So they, they are more successful. So, yeah, just quite an interesting situation over there. Yeah, it certainly is. Makes a change for them to be making the headlines. Well, our first final story 
uh, this week is of one of my favourite young soccer players, a 22-year-old. I'm going to I'm going to really read out her full name because I'd never come across this before. 22-year-old Katarina Cantahida Melonia Macario. She's a Brazilian-born American professional soccer player. Plays as midfield for for Lyon Lyon in the French division, feminine number one. She represents the US internationally, and she was a decorated collegiate player in the US. But she really has made her mark already. She's only 22, but she's had um, an injury, um, an ACL injury. Nancy, she's going to knock her sideways for a few months. Such a sad story. I mean, I really feel for her because she's just so talented and uh, yet so young. Yeah, it, it is. It is. She. Uh, anyone that watched the... Um women's Champions League final a few weeks ago would know how talented she is um, she's one of the goal scorers for Leon in that actually um, and yeah just very disappointing an ACL injury is always a massive blow because of the amount of time that you're out for and the way it impacts I suppose you know you really have to kind of push to come back and be playing at the same level um, so yeah a, ma- a massive blow for her at quite a crucial time in her career Um I think maybe the only positive is is that the US don't have a major tournament this summer and that she should be back in time for the World Cup next year. That is probably the only positive. Um, but hopefully she will be back soon um, and better than ever because, yeah, it's a, it's a big loss from, from women's football. It certainly is. And as we all know, if you have, if you do play sports of, of any sort, uh, soft tissue injuries uh, inevitably take longer and a broken bone um, and they yeah they can be really pesky so we wish her the very very best of luck and look forward to seeing her back on the pitch um, as you say stronger than ever um, and I hope you know I hope she enjoys the break and exercises uh, patience because that's the toughest part isn't it when you have an injury you know yourself Nancy it's just being patient and giving it the time that it needs to fully recover rehab um, and come back stronger and, and you know, and not short. You can't shortcut that because you risk re-injury. Yeah, that it is so crucial. You, even though it seems frustrating, you have to give it the proper attention it deserves. Otherwise, like you said, you can come back and then just be kind of in a constant cycle of injury. So even though you do hope she is back soon, at the same time you want her to be away for the adequate amount of time for her to uh, recover properly, and uh, when she comes back to to be fully fit and not not have a a recurring injury yeah for sure now i know you took a week off uh after your um i would say big hike over the mountains that was meant to be a bit of a race it turned out to be a different test uh to what you're used to but you're back in training now and, and looking at a marathon in the future so how's that how's the body feeling yeah okay I was I was went for a run today and I felt I did feel a bit tired and stuff and it's it's getting warm now over here so I think my body's just accustomed like reacclimatizing to running in summer um but yeah no I still 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 running and stuff so I haven't yeah quite planned what the next big run like you know event is but I'm sure I'll sort something out soon and then have something to to train towards Yeah I bet I bet you will because you've got the bug haven't you now yeah, definitely. I, d- I definitely, I'm a big fan of, of running events and it just, it keeps you motivated, doesn't it? So It does. Yeah. 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 I'm doing the same, you know, with my cycling. I'm, I'm back to training every day and, uh, uh, you know, really, really sort of motivated, really enjoy the feeling that it gives you when you get to a certain level of fitness, right? The, and, and, you know, the fitness and the lung capacity, as well as the strengths um, that, you know, when I do hills now and I'm not changing down as many gears, you know, I'm not going down into what they call the granny gear. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. <laughs> never. No, damn that. <laughs> um, but, they, you know, it, it does give you a really good feeling of, of that increased fitness. So, yeah, looking forward to later in the year, this year doing another big ride. So I'll keep you posted. But, uh, yeah, it really does motivate you. And are you playing uh, football still? Yes, I am. We're having a bit of a, well, not a summer break, but we just had like a free, so a few bank holidays here and stuff. So we, we've had like a month break, uh, but training starts again. I think it's next week. So yeah, back playing next week. So yeah, doing all sorts at the where, moment. Where, where, where do you play on the field? What's your position? 
Uh, I like, I don't know, because after coming back from injury, I was kind of like, I'm happy to go anywhere. I, I don't like playing in defence or, or goal, obviously. So anywhere in midfield or up front, that, that suits me. <laughs> okay. Um, we should mention, since we've got you here, um, and I know a lot of them, our American audience uh, pay attention to this too, is that you had a big party this past few days for the Queen's Jubilee celebrations. And it was incredible seeing the crowds um, that down the mall outside Buckingham Palace. The support that she still has, Nancy, is ex- extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I did. To be fair, I didn't because I was uh, up in Leeds, so I mean, I kind of missed London for the for the Jubilee weekend. But yeah, I had it was it was pretty uh, pretty busy for yeah, or around definitely in Central and stuff. There were a lot of people about. Yeah, but it ran for four days. So did you did you miss the concert and then you know the street parties because I know they were happening all over the country too, weren't they? Yeah, I think so. When did I go up to Leeds? I think I went up on, or maybe it was like Friday. I also don't get bank holidays with work, so that, that's right. yeah. I, I was working. I think I went. I was working on Friday at least, anyway. Um, but yeah, no, there was there was yeah. I could see stuff. On, I saw a bit of it on TV and stuff, but personally, I didn't experience much of it. But it was it was lovely weather and stuff. So everyone I knew that had the bank holiday had a good time. <laughs> Yeah, because I heard that, that, that they actually called a new bank holiday for this. So wasn't it Thursday and Friday, the bank, yeah. bank holiday as well? So you yeah. got Thursday, Friday bank holiday and then Saturday, Sunday being obviously a four-day weekend, essentially. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, like I said, because I work bank holidays anyway, so unfortunately I didn't get that. But everyone else got four days off, which is, I was happy for them. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> jealous. <laughs> well, you went and had some of your own fun as well, too, up, up there for that hike run I'm not going to yeah, call it exactly. a run because it really wasn't a run was it yeah I think it was definitely more more of a hike <laughs> for sure um, yeah I'm not sure if I'd be doing that particular event again now with um, Wimbledon starting at the end of the month what else are you looking forward to this month is, is, is the rest of the month like pretty quiet before we get to Wimbledon apart from the warm up tournaments in Nottingham and Birmingham and Eastbourne or what else is yeah, from that- tennis that's it really it is really just kind of the little tennis tournaments Wimbledon at the end uh just prepping for the Euros um in terms of other sports it's it is really limited I'm just I suppose preparing like gearing up to the Commonwealth Games as well which is at the end of July start of August um but that's still you know like nearly two months away so yeah, it I is very quiet it is well. now what about cricket because of course it's cricket season it is, but I don't think there's any women's cricket happening. I think the hundred is happening in August. In August, um, I don't think there's there's not there's it really is a very uh, it's a, definitely a lull at the moment. It is the calm before the storm because the rest of the summer is going to be hot, hot, hot for when it comes to women's sports. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just getting <laughs> ourselves ready for that. Remind everybody where to find you, uh, where they can read your stories, Nancy, and how they can find you on social media. Yeah, so I, on uh, Twitter, I'm at Nancy underscore Gillen and then Instagram uh, at Nancy Gillen underscore sport. And then, yeah, I write for Give Me Sport Women. So all our stuff is on the website or if you want to find us on Twitter, it's at Give Me Sport W. And we are, of course, at with Sports on social media channels. And uh, that's it for this week from Nancy and from myself, Chris Stafford. We'll be back next week with more stories from around the world of women's sports. So until then, thank you for listening and enjoy your sport. Sports.